institutions of influence have gone godless. The Christians have gotten out, they failed to be salt and light, and now Christians are trying to get back in and turn things around. If institutions of influence have gone godless when all recent presidents and about 90% of most recent Congresses have professed Christianity, then I wonder what kind of institutions would be God full enough for Frank. So Frank Turek recently posted a video about how and why Christians should be involved in politics. Now there are a few things I want to be clear about before we start. First, I'm not not, 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 not going to say anything that even alludes to my political stance on anything. Just talking about how pastors manipulated congregations on specific topics got me so much grief in the past and reduced my viewership by so much that I just don't feel like weathering that storm again. Maybe I should, but I don't. So in terms of political content, this will be extremely vanilla and will only talk about how Christians view their place in politics and in general the world. And that's going to be pretty easy because that's, well, all Frank talks about. Except abortion. He mentions that and I comment on how he mentions it. And I guess I'm also going to list off some things that are plainly known to be part of the evangelical agenda, so... Trigger warning for those who need it, I guess? I really wanted to make sure to get that out of the way right from the start. And if you think I sound passive-aggressive, that's... probably fair. Anyway, second... I think Christians absolutely should be allowed to participate in politics just like the rest of us. But that, just like the rest of us, is a double-edged sword. On one hand, there's the obvious meaning of the statement, which is that they should get to participate in politics like the rest of us, meaning they shouldn't be denied a place in the process just because of their faith. But on the other hand, they should have to participate in politics like the rest of us, meaning that just as most members of society are expected to articulate a secular justification for any policy they propose, Christians should too. Now let's be clear what I mean by secular. I don't mean anti-religious or atheistic. I just mean you need to be prepared to argue that a law has demonstrable real-life benefit. A law prohibiting murder, for example, has a clear benefit because murder does tangible, obvious harm, and the lack of an anti-murder law would turn society into a dangerous place. Conversely, a law saying you shouldn't wear mixed fabrics because doing so is prohibited in the Bible has no tangible benefit and is thus of no secular value. It's just insisting that people obey what you or someone who wrote a book thinks a God wants, and society is not beholden to anybody's sense of what a God wants, what is spiritually beneficial, or anything like that. That was a lot to open with, but we need to be crystal clear on these terms before moving forward. Saying Christians shouldn't make theocratic laws is not the same as saying they as people shouldn't have a place in politics. And saying they should have a place in politics should not open the door to them passing theocratic laws. So all I'm insisting is that they follow the same rules as the rest of us. Laws affect everything about life. In fact, laws affect your freedom, your church, your children, your family, your health, your money, your business, your property, your school, your home, your security, your safety, the poor, the unborn, the gospel, everyone and everything. Yeah, laws can affect all these things. That's why you want to make sure they don't overreach, and one major way of doing that is by making sure no one gets to create laws based on intangible and undemonstrable things like claims that God wants something. Also, notice how the unborn was thrown in there to make a specific political point. I mean, even if you think everything in the womb starting the moment the sperm hits the egg is a living human being, wouldn't it be part of life or your family? It seems pretty clear Frank's doing more than just trying to give a neutral list of things laws affect. Anyway, let's get this moving along. In fact, when people say, don't get involved in politics, just preach the gospel. I don't understand why a person would say this. Sure, get involved in politics and preach the gospel. But keep these activities distinct. If you think Jesus said nobody should ever get divorced and indicate the world is going to end soon, then fine. Preach about that. I mean, I'll argue that you're wrong in what you're saying is destructive, but you definitely have the right to preach that way. However, if you want to get involved in politics, don't try passing laws against divorce just because Jesus said so, and don't roll back environmental regulations just because you think the Bible indicates he's coming back soon. And for the f***ing love of God, please all look at the screen right now. I asked them, can you preach the gospel in North Korea? Not legally. Whoa, that took a hard turn toward hysteria. 
So once we all recover from the whiplash, let's take a moment to ask ourselves why he made this comment. For real, how does this even relate to, much less serve as a retort to, the comment, don't get involved in politics, just preach the gospel? The obvious insinuation is you can't totally divorce preaching from politics because you can't preach without the right to preach, at least not as effectively, and a certain amount of political involvement is required to maintain your rights. On paper, I can see the logic. But the way he draws a straight line from a lack of political activism to Christians losing the right to preach is pretty simplistic and obviously meant to appeal to Christians' sense that the world is waiting for its first chance to persecute them. If you're to read between the lines at all, as I'm sure Frank is trusting his audience to do, there's a built-in sense that unless Christians are bringing a Christian message into politics, then they're going to lose ground in some zero-sum game between pro-Christian and anti-Christian politics. This sense that everybody's purposely for or against Christianity can blur the line between a defensive battle in which besieged Christians are fighting for their rights and in the long run their lives, and an offensive battle in which they impose theocratic laws on the rest of society. Because if you're not gaining ground, you're losing ground, right? In fact, a member of Frank's audience, I assume in the middle of a question and answer thing with him, immediately buys into this insinuation and starts running with it herself. And that's why I'm concerned. Yeah. Because I want, I want my grandchildren mm-hmm. uh, to be able to speak the name of Jesus and to be able to be able to, you know, evangelize and I mean, live a quiet and godly life. And there we have it. This woman sadly but totally implausibly thinks there's a realistic danger that her grandchildren won't be able to speak the name of Jesus. And look at the last right she brought up. The right to live a quiet and godly life. Not only does this insinuate someone's trying to take that right from them, no, but it tries to claim this is the main thing Christians in our country are hoping for. Now I'm not going to say no Christian just wants to live a quiet and godly life. Maybe that's the main thing for a lot of them. For the sake of argument, let's even say most of them. But even associating these words with a politically active evangelical community is so weird it sounds sarcastic. Kind of like saying lions just want to curl up and take a peaceful nap right next to some antelope. Well, let me point out as to why we're here in this country now. Now, if you consider yourself conservative because you think that lines up more with biblical values, you know whose fault that Washington State and the United States has gone further and further left? It's the church's fault. I know, we've been apathetic. Because for the past hundred years, the church has been uh, absent. The church has been uh, absent. Well, if its absence includes the methodical and highly successful lobbying of groups such as the Christian Coalition or the falsely named Moral Majority, if it includes the concerted effort by countless churches to push for anti-abortion rights and anti-gay rights candidates in both national and local elections, if it includes prominent evangelical leaders having access to and publicly praying with U.S. presidents, if it includes a long-running calculated strategy that poisoned evangelical minority to control a population that clearly opposes it on many issues, including a Supreme Court made up mostly of Christians appointed by Christian chosen presidents, then please, Mr. Turek, if that's what the absence of the church in politics looks like, please describe what the presence of the church in politics would look like to you. Tell me what level of church influence you would need to satisfy you that your religion wasn't being left out in the cold. I doubt Frank would ever give us such an answer, because any level of domination above that which the church currently enjoys would be horrifying even to most Christians, which is why he needs to stay parked on the vague insinuation of old evangelical talking points. Because in the 1920s, the church didn't think it could interact and respond to, say, Darwinism, It became absent because it didn't respond to Darwinism. And let me make sure to emphasize the air quotes around Darwinism. Even if you want to use a stupid word like that for the robust and thoroughly evidenced theory of evolution, I don't think not challenging a scientific theory, which the church did with rabid uninformed ferocity, is what would set off the church not getting involved in politics. Which, again, it did with rabid, much more strategic ferocity even though now Darwinism is crumbling. Um, no, it's not. But then again, while the vast majority of scientists accept evolution as established fact, this guy says it's crumbling. Also, Darwinism isn't a thing. And so instead of engaging the culture, they separated from the culture. They created their own little Bible schools, their own little seminaries. Nothing wrong with that per se. 
but they separated from the culture. They got out of media, they got out of politics, they got out of education. They ceded all those things to the secularists. So a bit to unpack there, but let's start with a simple question. Who are the secularists? To even begin answering that question, we need to be clear about what it means for something to be secular, which is just that it doesn't involve explicit religious activity. A secular society isn't necessarily a society of people who don't believe in God. It's a society of people who know how to keep religion in its place and live constructively together based on what they can all agree upon as demonstrable fact. This is vital for any society to be able to do. For example, take a nation of millions of people from various cultural and religious backgrounds. Would anybody be able to convince the rest that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, or any of the countless others is the one true religion? No, because there's no factual basis for even starting that conversation. I mean, sure, you might really like yours. You're probably attached to it through tradition and community, and you might be convinced that yours is based on spiritual truths. But unless you're one of the few who's become convinced that a body of ass nine apologetics will convince everybody else to give up their face and come join yours, you probably, even without thinking about it, operate on the implicit understanding that no demonstration of fact will get everybody to agree to the same religion. So to live alongside others, you have to establish a set of rules based on principles most people can agree to. You simply can't demonstrate to anybody that God's a triune being, one third of which is named Jesus. But you can broadly agree upon certain principles of math, science, history, and so on, and you can strive to agree on certain political and organizational principles. So, secularists are just people who participate in this tacit agreement not to badger each other over questions like the first one, while finding enough commonality in the second body of questions to establish some kind of social cohesion that respects the autonomy of others. And here's the thing. Even a purely Christian society would need to be secular in order to survive as a healthy place to live. Because even if only Christians tried bringing questions of theology into politics, conversation would come to a halt, or become a bloodbath, over irresolvable questions of what Bible translations to use, whether to pray to Mary, whether we should still speak in tongues, how and when to meet for church, and on and on and on. I mean, that was a lot of the history of Europe until it separated politics from Christianity. So no matter who you are, you need secularism. Yet Turek treats secularists as this unified body of boogeymen who stand opposed to Christianity, which is pretty crazy nonsense. And speaking of crazy nonsense, let's address this idea that Christians withered under the threat of the secularists and withdrew from society. That's just silly. When Christians created their own schools, it's because they wanted to educate a small captive population in a way that you can't agree to educate the general public. That's not caving in. That's doubling down on your distinct personal beliefs and rallying your community around them the way the rest of society generally doesn't. If anything, it radicalizes your base of believers so they'll be more prepared to engage with society. And they didn't choose to get out of media. They've always produced media like crazy. They just sucked at it until starting to improve the quality of their music and very occasionally their movies to the point of being somewhat tolerable. And none of this genre building came from a lack of interest in engaging with culture. Ostensibly, the whole idea was to reach the broader culture with a message of Christ. And if we were to be more cynical, we might view it as a strategy of appealing to a niche market that would never be interested in their subpar product unless it was labeled Christian. Also, what about the number of major Hollywood productions that were explicitly about Christianity or the Bible? Compare those to the total cumulative number of productions that are about any other faiths. Think about that before whining about how uninvolved Christians are, Frank. The godly people got out. Is it any wonder why those... Uh, those institutions of influence have gone godless. The Christians have gotten out, they failed to be salt and light, and now Christians are trying to get back in and turn things around. So what we have here is an evangelical movement that's always been chasing political power and cultural influence, trying to rally its base to chase these things even harder by pretending it's been out of the game instead of, you know, largely dominating it. Which is a pretty cynical and brazenly garbage strategy. But while I see no excuse for someone like Frank, who for years has had both a sizable platform and every opportunity to get better informed to say such things, I can see how this would appeal to and even ring true to his audience. To see why, it would help to look at the metaphors he uses. That of Christians being salt and light. 
These, of course, are well-known figures of speech in Christianity, tracing back to a teaching attributed to Jesus in Matthew 5, and what they essentially describe as God's goodness shown through believers who, so the idea goes, are so clearly transformed by their relationship with Christ that the world would naturally be drawn to their example. I always found what Jesus said about salt to be a little bizarre, but he was more explicit about the light, saying it represents the good deeds of Christians. At any rate, in most Christian circles, the mere mention of salt and light taps into a deep-seated feeling Christians have, that their religion is so amazing that anybody in the world would be drawn to it if properly exposed to it, and any Christian who practices it properly would live a life of virtue that anybody would admire and joy that anybody would want for themselves. So given this, what are Christians supposed to think when they find the society around them increasingly indifferent to Christianity and at odds with their attempt to pressure or legislate others into compliance with Christian teaching? If you're immersed in and invested in the idea that the salt and light are inherently appealing to people, then it's very hard to come to peace with the idea that a large part of the population is well aware of Christianity but just not interested in it. So when you see institutions becoming more tolerant to the LGBTQ community, supporting abortion rights, or just otherwise being okay with people expressing themselves and engaging in lifestyles that fundamentalists consider sinful, or when you see this being depicted in the media or allowed for by law, it can't be just because this reflects the overall trajectory of society's attitudes. It can't just be because outside your little fundamentalist pod, people think differently in a variety of ways, and just keep doing what they're doing with your religion's teachings about gay marriage meaning as little to them as Islam's teachings about pork. Such a giant societal shift would represent a fundamental failure of Christianity as a concept, showing it to be far less than what a Christian believes it is. It would mean that Christians put the salt and the light out there for everybody to see, and the world just kind of shrugged and went on about its business. This simply could not have happened, so the problem must be that Christians failed to be the salt and light, that they abdicated their duty to get involved and influence the culture with a message that would surely transform it if they were doing their job. Or there's another problem, and I think Frank insinuates both in tandem, which is that a vaguely defined but probably small and certainly insidious group of secularists is poisoning society and manipulating laws. I mean, that's a much more bite-sized problem, right? And it appeals to the Christian narrative of persecution by dark forces rather than undermining the Christian narrative of the salt and the light being inherently awesome. But until Christians can own up to the true nature of what's actually happening in our society, they're going to continue being frustrated for all the wrong reasons. See, despite the fact that they've entrenched themselves in some powerful places in government and found some pretty insidious ways to impose theocratic laws onto the rest of society, they're still facing a tidal wave of public opinion that's opposed to both their agenda and their vision for society. And you can't beat such a wave into submission. You can't come up with enough rules to change the nature of an increasingly tolerant and pluralistic society. And frustration with trying to do so is what's being displayed in this video. Evangelicals haven't been left out of the game. They've just been unable to remake society in their image just by holding an overwhelming number of cards for a simple reason. Their religion is just, at its core, not as great as they think it is and they'll indulge any other paranoid fear to avoid thinking this, including that secularists are out to get them and they soon won't be able to say the name of Jesus. Because as chilling as that fantastical persecution fantasy is, it's a lot more palatable than facing up to the unremarkable nature of your own religion. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.